folks, I thought I'd shoot a quick video here today surrounding weight loss and endurance sport. So this is something that I spent a long time in study and experience with. Um, I started weight loss and, and weight cutting for weight-based sports. My first exposure would have been about 11 or 12 years old for wrestling. Wasn't super serious back then or, or, or well um, approached, but um, that's just the reality of weight class based sports. Um, and a lot of the approaches and strategies I seen when I was younger, um, coming up through, through sport were quite horrendous, actually, like whether that's kids having locks on their cupboards and fridges or kids being locked in saunas, uh, during water cuts, um, some really crazy, crazy stuff out there. And obviously I don't advise any adolescent that's in the development stage to deprive themselves of nutrients for a performance gain. Um, but that's just the reality of, of what sport is like. So also I'm not a doctor uh, or a lawyer or a psychologist or, or really anything. Um, so take what I'm saying here with a grain of salt, but um, I will try and pass forth what useful strategies, approaches, also some of the underlying physiology and biology and the processes that are uh, inherent with weight loss. Um, so I'm going to kind of wrap a framework of, uh, around weight loss and how I view it um, and how I approach it and kind of throw it out there for you guys. You can take what you want or throw away it all. It's, it's not really a problem. But So right quick, let's actually break down hazard and risk. So people know where I'm coming from when I say that. So hazard is the consequence of the action or the process that you're engaging in. Now risk is the probability of that actually happening. So something can be low hazard, but high risk or vice versa, high hazard and high hazard consequence and low risk, right? Low probability of that happening. So um, everything's kind of framed under that. So let's talk about the pillars now of what I consider some of the hazards to be aware of whenever you're engaging in weight loss. So one would be illness. First and foremost, I think everyone's familiar with that. Illness is a big one. Having uh, a, a few days of being sick can throw off your training for several weeks, right? To recover from that. Or like I experienced earlier this year when there was a lot of stuff going around um, where I was living. We all in the house got quite sick. You know, when your daughter's throwing up uh, two inches from your face, it's it's hard to um, it's hard to change that reality. And we all end up getting sick for for quite a long time, and that in, impairs any type of training quite dramatically. So whether that's for you know two weeks or a month or whatever it is, depending on the sickness, whether it's pneumonia, uh, a slight respiratory infection. Uh, upper respiratory infection, they're all going to differ on the hazard, but it is a fairly high hazard. So one way to approach combating that would be to bolster your immune system because when you're engaging in weight loss, one inherent thing is going to be immunosuppression. Um, so bolstering your immune system by exposing yourselves to very short, brief, high stressors can be, can be one way, right? So whether that's something like uh, cold water, and going into an ice bath for a few minutes, that is one way to enhance your and, and bolster your immune system. Another one would be getting adequate sun exposure or supplementation with vitamin D would be another one. So we know that the needs of an athlete for vitamin D are actually going to be higher than uh, most uh, individuals in the general population. So that's something to take in consideration. So if you're not getting adequate sunlight or um, because of your skin type, maybe Fitzpatrick 2 or something like that, um, you don't want to expose yourself to too much sun, uh, vitamin D supplementation would be something to consider. Um, so that would be, uh, you know, a hazard and some of uh, the strategies that I would use to, um, you know, combat that, that hazard and lower the risk. Um, let's move into overtraining, overreaching, um, endocrine dysfunction, right? So uh, dysfunction that is commonly seen in, in a lot of athletes that they're chronically in the state, you know, high cortisol, um, and, they're, and they're shutting down, um, you know, production of testosterone, all these things that are going to help you recover. And also with that high cortisol decrease in protein synthesis and all these other offshoots of, of what we see with, um, you know, 
chronic dieting with chronic high exercise load. Um, so one way to combat that would be monitoring your mood and motivation, monitoring your recovery, right? Um, these things are quite inherently tied to overtraining, overreaching, um, and endocrine dysfunction. Also, macronutrients is first and foremost, right? Diet and sleep, we know, are the pillars, right? If you, but if you're, if you're already kind of trying to move off of those because those are um, kind of maxed out to the best of your ability, looking into increasing um, some of the macronutrients in your diet, whether that's uh, more fat, right? Because we know on some of these low-fat diets that we need fats to um, make the hormones that our body needs to function properly and respond to exercise properly. So increasing your, your fat intake, obviously, um, from good sources. Another pillar to be aware of would be uh, injury. So we know that anytime we increase stress load, whether it's from exams or work or relationship problems um, and training, that the risk of injury is going to increase, right? So we have to take that consideration and think about, hey, um, is there too much load here? Am, am, I, am I approaching weight loss at an inappropriate time in my season? Could I more effectively um, push it into a different portion of my season and get better gains and also stave off the risk of injury? And also with certain diets that people um, engage in, including myself, and I still do sometimes here and there, and I have in the past, um, for example, low carb, high fat diets. So we, we do know this from research that um, engaging in that type of diet does decrease uh, bone mineral density. So that's why you see a lot of athletes into those diets um, end up with stress fractures um, if the training load is too high and they're not retaining the minerals that they need um, in that diet. So that's why you see f stress fractures in weird places and practitioners were wondering what was going on for a long time. But there was bits and pieces uh, in the research previous, but now it's starting to get a little bit more um, recognized. To some strategies to approach that would be maybe reducing some of your, your training volume in the sport and increasing um, some of your resistance training. Now, I don't think that's always the you know, best approach, but it, it is an approach to, to do to prevent injury. Um, also, like I said, just making sure you're aware of the inherent qualities of the diet that you're engaging with. So understanding maybe you need more creatine, maybe you need more B vitamins, maybe you need more mineral replacement. Also, um, one that I think that is commonly skipped over with endurance sport is protein. So a lot of endurance athletes think, um, you know, protein might not be as important because you're not engaging in strenuous resistance training. Um, but I've seen some papers saying that, um, you know, the needs for endurance athletes for protein might actually be higher than those that are um, in resistance training. And when you think about it, when you're exercising for several hours a day now, yeah, it might not be the same type of loads and intensities in resistance training, but there is a lot of physiological processes that are going to be dependent upon protein um, to adapt to training. So that's something to keep in mind and something to be aware of. So I don't think you can ever really go wrong with higher protein. I'm not saying slam, um, you know, shakes all day long. Also staving off muscle loss, lean tissue loss, I think is an important thing, right? We want um, to think about the high cortisol already causing some poor body recomposition, right? You're also seeing the decrease in testosterone and, and decrease in protein sy synthesis from that. So we want to take into account, um, you know, maybe if we increase our protein, uh, maybe if we lift a little bit, that can come to serve us a, a little bit better. So those are kind of the big pillars I think about uh, managing um, whenever you're engaging in weight loss. Now let's talk a little bit about when would be good times to incorporate the weight loss in your season. Now with running and cycling, I think of them fairly similar. You're going to want to do most of your weight loss before your season starts. But there is some differences in how I'd approach that with running. Um, for example, with myself, running at 215 pounds versus running at 175 pounds is two different sports to me. They're two completely foreign um, activities, right? They do not feel whatsoever the same. So I think um, 
going out there and getting a lot of the weight loss done and implementing you know your caloric restriction and dieting before you even get into your base training season is a smart route um, because running holds a lot of inherent load you're having these repetitive collisions with the ground 10,000 20,000 times in a session and the inflammation markers uh, associated with that are quite high stresses with that is quite high so take that in consideration before you start running you want to kind of get your bulk or in your like kind of off phase maybe you're biking upstairs and or in the basement or whatever you're doing um, try and get a lot of that weight loss in before you approach your base season because the base season is already going to provide quite a bit of stimulus and you want to be um, you know, ready to receive that rather than trying to pull too many levers at once. Now with cycling, it's a little bit different when I think about it because you know the inherent qualities of cycling, you're, you can cycle for many more hours in a week than you can with running, right? That's why you see professional cyclists doing 30, 35 hour weeks peak um versus runners you know that's 12 14 hours peak during their training season so thinking about cycling um you can start to incorporate that basically i would say right after you get your legs under you in the base season right probably you don't need to incorporate it right away because you're already trying to expose yourself to that stress but once you get your legs underneath you once you get some miles in the bike um and you're kind of sitting on top of that base uh, accumulation of getting um back into training that would be a good time before you start intensifying a little bit before the um the season comes up um so yeah those are kind of some of the things i would take into consideration now the same thing when it's going on in season i would probably try to avoid any type of weight loss because the season itself is going to carry a lot of stress um, but it might be different your season might be set up differently you might be able to get away with a little bit of weight loss, especially in cycling. You might have some more B races in the beginning of the season. Your A races are at the end. Um, and you might be able to get away with a little bit more than you would be if you were running. So take all these things into consideration um, when, when you're going out with your weight loss and saying, hey, what would be the best time? Because if you cheat, um, if you take diet breaks in inappropriate times or put off the weight loss, and if you want to be at a certain weight for your race season, you're going to inherently push the weight loss into a more risky portion of your season, right? Or a risky portion of your training. You're creating more risk for yourself, if I could put it that way. So it's not um, always best to take breaks at certain times if everything is responding well. So make the um, good decisions and understanding how am I responding, monitor your recovery, whether that's through HRV, um, grip strength, or like the orthostatic, um, Rusco orthostatic test. Um, yeah, monitor, just, just monitor how you're responding, monitor how you're recovering. If that performance is dropping off too much, um, if that performance hasn't come back up, you know, maybe it's time to start adding a little bit more calories back in and try and and um and resolve some of the issues that you're dealing with so monitor performance right because if we're not monitoring our performance and we're just monitoring our weight loss um, that's that's backwards and i've done that i've got sucked into that before too because you want to be at a certain weight this is the weight you need to be at and um you know I, i've got blinded by that several times so make sure that we're we're, we're keeping our eyes on the prize um so yeah, if there's anything that you want me to elaborate on in there that I talked about, if there's anything that you want me to discuss in further detail or any questions or maybe any tips or strategies that's worked well for you, um, certain diets, you know, just just let me know in the comments below and, and all my stuff is in the description. So all my links for my stuff, if you want to find me anywhere to, to reach out by all means. So have a good day, folks.